Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. My name is Matt Lacerdo. I'm from the Office of Alumni Relations. Um, I also want to send a special thank you and welcome to any of our admitted students and families that may be joining us today. Uh, I know that there were a few that might be joining us. So thank you and welcome to your first Northeastern experience with some of our wonderful esteemed uh, panelists. Um, and with that, I really just want to kind of give a couple of quick instructions. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat. We're more than happy to get that over to our panelists then. Um, and we'll be able to make sure that those are answered. And if not, we'll make sure to get it to our panelists afterwards so they can try to get an answer to you. Um, along with that, um, the best way to kind of see the main person speaking at the time is in that uh, top right corner of your screen, there should be a little view button. Please feel free to hit that and hit speaker view. Um, and also we always ask if you can please leave yourself on mute just during the presentation so we don't have any background noise you know, a, a random trash truck or something like that that may go by that you aren't expecting can maybe throw off a little bit of the presentation in our speakers. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it off because I know you don't want to listen to me anymore. So we'll go over to that. And Allison, feel free to take it over. And uh, we really look forward to this presentation. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Uh, and welcome to Northeastern if you're uh, just joining us uh, as a new family. Um, and what I'd like to talk about today is our panel discussion. It's going to be very interesting. And this discussion is about um, liberal arts and how it matters in the age of COVID. And, you know, I think that this conversation is also about the College of Social Science and Humanities at Northeastern and what they've done over the last uh, 12 months, you know, when we've all been impacted by COVID-19. So if we think about last year, I think that we can all agree that our society was really forced to change how we live, how we work, how we socialize. And that's occurred because of this pandemic. And, you know, were we ready for it? Uh, you know, I, I think some of us might say no, but I think we've all had the experience where, you know, our everyday activities have come to a grinding halt because Social distancing became our weapon against uh, COVID-19. So to be sure, the uh, last 12 months of the pandemic has amplified inequities in our communities and in our country. And we've had uh, months of reckoning as a result of the death of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter protests. And you know, I think there's been a special focus on past and present racism. And, you know, over the last several months, indeed, you know, even our institutions that we've all relied on, you know, for a long time, have been the subject of deep distrust. And so as we think about the US election and everything that happened, you know, in the last, you know, three to four months, and we think about our healthcare system, where people weren't even trusting our healthcare system, you know, it's important to talk about you know, how we navigated these, you know, impacts and what are we doing as a university and how has the university coped during this time? So as we talk about um, these events, we're going to talk to some very interesting people. They are directly, uh, you know, involved in a lot of activities with Northeastern. And I think we're going to hear about how they fared. And I, I, I think you'll find that we've done some great things. And I think we've had some learnings. So with that, I'm going to jump right in. You know, I'm pleased to uh, ma moderate this um, panel discussion. And um, I'd like to invite my panelists to each say a few words about themselves when they have the opportunity to speak. So let's jump right in. And um, let's go to Dean Poiger. She is, you know, our Dean. And I think, Dean, we, we've talked about liberal arts education. And, you know, if you receive a liberal arts education, you will have the ability to think critically. So how has the college's experiential liberal arts model prepared the college for the work that's been done during the pandemic. 
Alison, thank you so much for this question. And before I answer this question, let me just take this opportunity to thank you as distinguished alumna and also as a key member of the Dean Strategy Council, as well as Ed, um, in the chair of our Dean Strategy Council and our panelists, Lisa Lincoln and um, Kyla as well for joining this conversation. Also want to join you in welcoming our audience and look forward um, to questions from you in the audience. Um, ultimately as well. Alison posed um, a big and important question. How did our experiential liberal arts mission prepare us um, for COVID? And I think Alison, you early on suggested that none of us were really prepared. Um, and um, that was going from the individual level um, to um, the level of institutions such as cities and states and the international community. And yet at um, the local level and certainly at Northeastern um, and in many other ways, we have seen such important adaptations as well as also a highlighting of social inequities. And um, so the pandemic has been a very um, difficult time and at the same time also a time for um, a lot of important innovation and a lot of important thinking. At the core of our experiential liberal arts mission, which we have formulated for the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, are really three things. One is the intertwining of our research, teaching, and engagement with communities around us missions. So again, intertwining research, teach, teaching, and engagement. And those of you who are alums, but I'm sure also all of you who are parents are of course are very aware that co-op is one of the foundations on which we engage with communities. I hope that in the course of our conversation today, you will also hear about other modes of engaging, be it through um, our research or through service learning, um, just to give you a couple of examples. We also see, um, again, local and global engagement as very important um, to our mission. That means being very conscious of our locations, uh, which, as you know, in the Code Global Campus Network, extend at this point from Boston to London um, to Vancouver, just to give three of our campuses to Portland, Maine, of course, as well. And another um, um, important characteristic of the experiential liberal arts mission that I would like you to keep in mind as I ultimately talk about our pivots during COVID is that we really see responding to and integrating the digital into the work we do in the social sciences in the humanities and also in policy work is very, very important. Now, these were all values that were well established in the college before the pandemic hit us. We then, um, as so many institutions and really as all um, universities, went into a complete remote work mode um, in March of last year, so just about a year ago. And then ultimately, we we're first able to bring research activities back to campus. And by September, we we're able um, to bring more colleagues and students back to campus um, as well. And um, the success of that um, physical opening, I think, is something um, that we are very um, proud of. At the same time, we have operated um, and continue to operate in what we um, call different modalities. And I've joked with some of you, so let me just do this with all of you in the audience as well. My family um, started to complain that I was using the word modality way too often. But honestly, thinking in different modalities, I think we all have experienced that, right? So we had first our courses pivot to um, synchronous um, learning via Zoom, as well as using more of the Blackboard and Canvas platforms for delivery of content um, as well. We then pivoted completely to Canvas and to a much more mixed model by the fall uh, semester. The reason I can give you some evidence that overall that was successful. Our students were incredibly generous with us as were our faculty and staff. And all this happening, of course, and all of you are so aware uh, of that during a time when there was just so much uncertainty about physical health, but also when caregiving became something that was um, so much on the agenda for so many people, especially childcare, but also the care of elders. Um, for many families, also grieving involved, um, anxiety involved. So um, overall, a, a really um, difficult time. 
Again, so much generosity of the members of our communities, from parents to alumni, to our community partners, to our faculty, staff, and students. And so I will say that we brought um, the spring semester to a successful conclusion. Our students then joined us in record numbers. And you know, in the college, we teach, of course, our own majors. But the majority of our credit hours, that we, as we call it, we actually do deliver to students from around the university. And they joined us in record numbers. And I think that has something to do with the fact that work in the social sciences and humanities actually was somewhat easier to transfer into the mixed modalities in which we have operated than true wet lab work, for example. But also that our students, and no matter what the major was, um, found affirmed something that we had been seeing before the pandemic, that they really enjoy looking at big problems from multiple angles. And they recognize that the social sciences policy um, work, um, humanities work also can provide some of these frameworks. This goes hand in hand with the development that we've seen over the last few years in the college, that more and more of our students at the undergraduate level are in what we call combined majors, and many of them in combined majors that cross colleges. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, uh, English and biology, for example, and what a time to have a combination such as English and biology or health sciences and sociology in order to um, look at how to make an impact, how to also analyze uh, a period of such intense crisis, a period that I think Alison captured so well for us when she talked about the three prongs of that crisis, the health crisis, um, the, um, the, the awakening to a need for more reckoning, which is certainly focused heavily on the United States, but also is in many ways a global phenomenon. And then of course, also the crisis of governance um, that we have seen in so many different um, contexts. So I would be very happy to answer many more questions um, related to this. Let me just end on one more note. One thing that we had seen beforehand is that many of our students were asking for more online offerings. And I'm sure you have all noticed that um, the validity of online learning has been much debated in the press and sometimes, quite frankly, in way too simplistic terms. But because of flexibility for their schedules, because they wanted to do classes with us while being abroad, or because of um, wanting to do a class, say, while being on co-op, we had, and also because of our professional master's programs, we had moved more into online sc spaces. And that meant um, really quite in contrast to many of our peer um, and aspirant institutions, that in our college alone, about a quarter of the faculty had online teaching experience. And they really helped their colleagues in thinking through what one does in synchronous ways, such as what we are doing right now on Zoom together, and what one does in a more online asynchronous um, what we call online um, teaching and learning. And so that foundation too was important for the successes that we've had in terms of having really strong numbers of students being with us, having those students stay engaged, having you know students be retained to the university, which is always so important, especially important during the, the pandemic. And so you can tell that I'm quite grateful for how the different um, communities involved in the college really rallied together um, to, um, to make this overall, I think a year that we can um, uh, say was a successful year in spite of it all, or is a successful um, year in spite of it all. Alison, back to you. Thank you. <laughs> so I was going to ask you, you know, you talk about these successes and you talk about how the university has navigated, you know, this crisis we call the pandemic, but we had other things going on last year. And so it seemed like it was sort of a convergence of a couple of different things. And so can you speak a little bit about what that meant to the university and how you sought to solve, you know, problems and, you know, move forward with the convergence of, you know, a couple of different things. We have the pandemic, we have, uh, you know, protests in the streets, we have, you know, the election coming up, deep distrust in healthcare. I mean, people, you know, very concerned about this pandemic. What did, what did the school, what did the university do in order to navigate all? 
Thank you, Alison. And I'm thinking that our other panelists will have also answers to this very good question. So let me just give you a few examples that again, I think are in the spirit of what we have been talking about. For example, last March, a number of colleagues from around the university, including Elisa Lincoln, who's on this call um, as well, and who's a sociologist with a focus on questions of mental health, put together um, a, a short training program that I ultimately was taken up by the Coast Guard as well. That was about how to handle safety at this time when you know we had a government that initially debated very much whether face masks were going to be useful, what the use of hand washing was and so on. And, um, and you know, basically put out a program that reached ultimately hundreds of thousands um, of people in order to have some in, in, initial benchmarks as to how one might think about how to behave in this period of so much much um, uncertainty and when, as you said so eloquently, social distancing, uh, which I always thought and many of our resilience studies scholars also thought was an unfortunate term because we wanted it to be more physical and not also social distancing. But we all have had to recognize that in fact the physical distancing has come with some social um, distancing as well. But as you said, became really our main weapon um, in the context of the pandemic. We have um, had in the college previous um, to the events of um, last summer, um, you know, uh, um, we deliver, for example, the majority of courses that have diversity and difference um, as a learning outcome goal um, for the university. And so we have a lot of expertise in our college on questions of race and social justice. And so that allowed us to run public events, run us run trainings. And at the same time, what I think all of us have been clear on is we too um, need to always um, think um, from our different standpoints about how we are uh, contributing um, to um, um, difficulties, um, to uh, failures in the reckonings that we need, um, to um, continuations of um, power relations that need to be changed. And so what's been very rewarding is to see faculty student staff again with um, external communities engaged in those conversations as well. Our writing program, for example, um, ran community based writing workshops um, about where people were encouraged um, to use creative writing in order to express themselves during the triple, um, I mean, minimum dual, but I'm now going to put the governance one as a triple pandemic into it during the triple pandemic in the fall and in this semester again we are right, running a racial literacy um, series our dean strategy council and you'll hear more from Alison and ed there have been very important advisors um, to us there as well as to what is um, important um, to do so recognizing that we have strong foundations and then that we always need to adapt has been um, so important in this context um, for sure so let's hear from uh, Dean Lincoln about research, because you talk about the research, you talk about the fact that we're remote. So Associate Dean Lincoln, can you share with us how the pandemic has impacted you, the university from your perspective? And let's talk a little bit about the research that was done during the last year. Sure, happy to do that. Um, so initially the university in March faced the challenge of what to do with ongoing research as the pandemic uh, sort of and its impacts hit the university that included faculty, staff and students all engaged in research. And one of the things that um, I found pretty impressive was all of the associate deans of research got together with the senior vice provost of research and many, many other folks from around campus to think about things that ranged from you know, what do you do when a shipment of white mice arrive at the university and there's no lab to put the, the mice into, right? Um, now, and as Dean Poiger said, in some ways, for those of us in the College of Social Science and Humanities, it was a bit easier to pivot during COVID. Um, and so I think at the university level, there was a real coming together to think about how to support each college and how to work across the colleges to support. But early in the pandemic, both the university and the College of Social Science and Humanities began to provide seed funding to research teams, both to pivot their ongoing research, to think about how do you keep doing what you're doing and do that during uh, physical distancing, um, or how do you begin to think about questions that are arising with COVID or later on in the summer, racial justice, uh, 
as they arise, or for other folks to think about new high impact research projects that brought together diverse expertise of our colleagues within CSSH and reaching across uh, the other colleges to help us better understand the pandemic and its many social, economic, ethical, political impacts. Uh, and so in addition to this funding related to COVID and CSSH, I think we were quite proud to be able to more than double the opportunities for pilot projects in the past year, including a specific call for proposals to further research addressing issues of racial equity and justice, um, and to allow our teams to have additional support during these really, really challenging days. Um, and this work of our faculty and student teams has really led to some exciting ongoing initiatives, uh, in many cases receiving larger externally funded grants to further develop these projects. And I will mention just a few examples of these. So um, keep in mind, these are a selected few, there are many more. Uh, and it's important to notice that these tackle the very kind of complex challenges that Dean Poiger referred to. And that in addition, each of these is engaging CSSH students in research projects, and many are continuing to engage with diverse community partners. Um, so for instance, Dan O'Brien, who is our director of the Boston Area Research Institute, which are known as BARI, uh, and his colleagues, Nick Beecham and Ryan Wang, recently received IERPA funding for a project to quote predict, it's called Predict the Next Outbreak. Um, and this project is in collaboration with the Costas Research Institute in Burlington and will support faculty and a team of postdocs, grad students and undergrads to use the various data sets that the Boston Area Research in Initiative has been gathering over the last year to attempt to retrospectively predict localized COVID outbreaks in greater Boston. And Dan and his team have been able to do this down to the zip code level um, or at the municipality level. And these results will hopefully help the government to implement a forecasting system for the time between now and herd immunity or any subsequent flare ups from variants or future pandemics. Uh, another example is the work of Victoria Kane and her teams. She's an associate professor of history and she works with both undergrad and grad students. And they have helped to create a uh, resource called a Journal of the Plague Year, an archive of COVID. Uh, and I can drop the link into the chat, but I realize I'm not gonna do it right now because the multitasking is not quite there yet, but I will drop it in. It's a really wonderful digital repository where people can crowdsource images, oral histories, videos, and stories about the global experience of COVID-19 and create a lasting historical record of this really um, unprecedented moment. Um, Another example is the work of Alicia Modestino, who is an associate professor of public policy and economics. She's also the director of research for our Dukakis Center. She and Jamie Ladge, who is a uh, associate professor in the business school and myself have a project to explore the impact of diverse employer practices, child care models, family work stressors and mental health and well-being during COVID. Uh, this work, like many of our CSSH faculty and student teams, has led to a great deal of public engagement for the team, including uh, Professor Modestino's work on childcare being cited on ABC's Nightline, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. My personal favorite was the Trevor Noah show. Um, and our team is now transitioning, right? Because this, you know, the COVID is not, it's not a static thing uh, to increasing understanding of how people are managing um, either continuing to work during COVID, so for many they did never they never transitioned to remote work, or thinking about reentry. Right? What is this process going to be like as people start to return to workplaces, and what do we know, and what can, what have we learned that will help support that? Uh, and then just. Lastly, I'll just throw this one in because we just heard today and it was so exciting. We, we actually just got word today that Professor Linda Blum, who's a professor of sociology, uh, will receive a Spencer Foundation grant um, to do a project that's called Biographical Disruption, Transitions from College to Adulthood amid the, pan amid the pandemic and its aftermath. Uh, and as you can imagine, this is a very timely study. If we think about the students that we all work with who are you know, transitioning uh, to adulthood in so many ways during this really unprecedented moment. So I will stop there. Oh, well, I could go on and on and on. <laughs> well, thank you. But let me, let me just ask you one question. So you talk about yeah. all of these really interesting projects. Can you share a little bit about how you get students engaged with professors to work on these really amazing projects? Absolutely. So there are uh, a range of, of mechanisms by which uh, faculty and students come together. So uh, the university has an event called Source. Oh, did I get the name wrong? Laura Green or Uda, help me. 
source, source. is good. Source, source is good. good. <laughs> Just had and, a mo- and, and students get the peak awards, Elisa. Yes, I was going there. But the university has a large event each year where many of people who do research go. And, and this year it was virtual and uh, students can attend and meet faculty, learn about their projects. The provost office gives out a number of awards called the peak awards that will provide stipends and supplements for students. Many students get involved with research through their work study which I think is a fabulous way to get involved in the research process. Some faculty, uh, you know, pull students into research through classwork. Um, But I think there are many different ways that students get involved. Sounds good. So let's hear from a student. So Kylie, uh, you were on campus last year. You are on campus now. You are due to graduate uh, in a few months. So tell us what it's been like to be on campus during COVID and living through some of the things that we are talking about today. Yeah, thank you. Um, So yeah, last spring I was in classes when we went online and then I completed a co-op over the fall and I'm back in classes now. So I've had a lot of different on-campus experiences during COVID, right? Um, My, in particular, like right now on campus, sorry, I go to one of my classes in person, which is like an incredible thing to be able to do. Um, never thought like you know, in the fall and the spring, we last spring we'd be able to do that, but can. Um, <laughs> and I actually spent some time tabling in the quad today for the first time in like two years. You'll have so, to explain to us what that means, tabling. Oh yeah, of course. So um, I'm a part of the Student Government Association on campus. Um, I've been the vice president for student involvement for two years now. And our student body elections are coming up where the entire student body votes for president and executive vice president. So when we tabled to like spread the word about that happening, we basically take, you know, a large table, put it in a quad and put, uh, you know, tablecloth posters on it. And usually we attract people to the table to talk to us about it with food. But this year we're trying to, you know, find other ways to, you know, attract people before, besides just like yelling, hi, how are you doing across the quad to get them to talk to us about student body elections. But um, that's been an incredible way to be able to interact with more people again um, in a safe way, obviously. And I spent my co-op actually, which, you know, not entirely on campus, but my co-op was kind of impacted by COVID a bit too. I worked for the Department of Justice in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, but I got to do my co-op half in person, half, half remote, um, which was like, like I was told it was a very different experience because that office is usually like very fast paced, very lively, and there weren't that many people there. But, um, and so instead of like doing a lot of trial prep and all of that type of stuff, I actually got to do a lot of in-depth research. Um, I got to do some legal writing, like writing motions for judges that normally co-ops don't get to do. So in that kind of way, like COVID definitely changed my co-op experience, but I wouldn't, it definitely made it just as impactful as it would have been otherwise. Um, Yeah, on campus, I'm trying to- Were you surprised? So so I remember going on co-op very well, and it was always, I always looked forward to going on co-op, but when COVID happened in March, I mean, did you say to yourself, my co-op is over or what, what were you thinking? And, and how did the university help you to realize that, hey, I'm going to do this co-op and I'm going to move forward to where you are today? Yeah, um, I actually had gotten my co-op very early. I got it in early February and most people I knew were still like trying to get a co-op when we went online. Although to be fair, when we first went online, no one thought it was going to last past the summer. Like I didn't even think about my co-op being impacted the first like couple weeks, right? And then you know, we start, you start thinking about it. Like one of my friends like lost her co-op because of it. And she managed to find another one. The university helped her find another one, but she had like lost it. And then you get a little anxious about it. But, um, you know, my co-op advisor was very like, you know, straightforward with me. She was like, your co-op is gonna happen. They're making like, they're making it work for you. Cause usually we couldn't have done it online because of the secure servers we had to use and stuff, but they were like making it work for me. Um, and like, I just, you know, you know, my start date got pushed back a little bit, but um, I still had like a great experience, you know, I still had a great experience and I was still like always like, you know, you're, you're doing this co-op. Like it was very like reassuring everyone at the university was like, you're doing this co-op. And if obviously if it doesn't happen, we're going to figure something else out. Cause obviously I'm graduating. So I didn't have a lot of right. time left. <laughs> so figuring things out um, has been a big thing at, at Northeastern this year, because I know uh, I, I think sometime last year I had agreed to participate in the RISE competition. 
And, you know, that was supposed to be in person. I was looking forward to coming uh, to Boston to be a judge. And then all of a sudden, we weren't sure this was going to happen. And I can tell you all that it actually happened. And it was all virtual. And, you know, my experience was a pretty amazing one in that, um, you know, I got to watch students present on some amazing projects and research. I mean, talk about innovation. I mean, it was amazing. And what I think about that now is, hey, you know, we use technology for just about everything, to socialize, to do medicine, you know, to get medical services. You know, we use it for everything to work. And, you know, I don't think we were that dependent on technology until about a year ago. So I, I think the key here is that there's been a lot of figuring out, you know, how do we move forward? So let me move over to Ed. And Ed, you are the chair of the Dean's Strategy Council. I'd like to ask you, you know, how did, how did this pandemic uh, change or impact the way you ran the council? And what are the things that you, you know, that you thought we should focus on as a council? I'm now on the council, folks. <laughs> um, but what did you think um, we needed to focus on given the convergence of all of these events in one year? Uh Thanks. Let, let me let me first acknowledge what everybody can tell, which is that it's a, it's an honor to be on the council, and we have some very talented people, as as Allison is demonstrating. Um, the the Dean Strategy Council is an opportunity for alumni and for parents to have input directly into the activities and practices at the at the college and the university, and a lot of the credit for that goes to Dean Poyer but also the other folks uh, on faculty and the administration who've been supporting us. What we've done here is we've created this entity that allows us to participate very directly in the university. And so we've tackled the pandemic like any other institution in the sense that we're now virtual, I would say. We've gone from, of course, the in-person meetings to being more, uh, more virtual. And in fact, it's been a benefit because now we seem to be meeting a lot more frequently and we're able to take advantage of addressing specific issues as they come up. And in, in that regard, uh, I would say the kinds of things we really have tried to focus on are the issues that are affecting the university and, and, uh, and its community more broadly. How do we conduct this college during this type of situation. So we've been directly involved in issues of reopening, issues of how do you adapt the curriculum to fit the current situation? And are there particular areas that we should be focusing on? We have been involved in the, the uh, research areas that have been discussed uh, earlier that, that the university is focusing on. And we've had a chance to provide our input and reaction to some of that. So. It's all been very worthwhile and, and hopefully have some benefit all, uh, for all concerned. So as we think about um, some of the, 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 the changes that we've made at the university, I'd like to throw this open to anyone who wants to answer this question. So, you know, there are things that I kind of describe as pandemic gifts. And I talk about that at work. Um, you know, none of us thought we'd be home for a year. I've been going to the office every day, but my entire team in every location, and we're in five locations, everyone's at home. And we really needed to make sure that we were able to run our business effectively and efficiently, even though everyone's at home. So what are some of the pandemic gifts that you all have experienced at the university? And, you know, Ed, if you answer this question, I'd like to know, if you see any opportunities uh, for future gifts that the university can benefit from, just you know, from, from the learnings that we've had in the last year. Allison, well, if you I, don't- I can take it, I can take it briefly. Good. I can take it briefly and then pass, then pass the baton is, is one of the opportunities that we have at, at the Dean Strategy Council as I said, is in helping to shape areas. Some of that comes with our ideas, some of that comes with our philanthropy, 
And some of that comes really with just building on the work of, of, of many others. And we have had a chance now to be tackling some of the most difficult issues that we as a society face. Just a couple of very quick examples. Knowledge is power. And the understanding of how government functions and its limitations, as well as its, its goals and purposes, is something that we see now is reflected in exactly how our society is, is interacting. So there's a lot of um, confusion out there about you know, what, what are the constitutional limits of government? What is, what is the role of, of different bodies in government in terms of certifying elections? You know, that's, a, that's an issue of tremendous interest and remains of tremendous interest. A university is in best position to help educate and to help understand those issues that transcend anything. Um, we've also been taking on and helping to sponsor uh, analysis of relationship issues, violence in, in personal relationships. We've seen during the pandemic, unfortunately, that there has really been a pretty dramatic upcreek, uh, uptick in terms of interrelationship violence. In some ways, it, you, know, you can see that it, it, is a, it is something that may result from the more confined arrangements we have and people don't have the normal socializing. And so from a university perspective, we have a chance to try to look into those issues, you know, for the betterment of society and the broader issue of how is this pandemic really playing out in terms of racial justice, economic justice. It, it, it's clear that there are differing impacts on differing groups. All of these issues are, are essential to the, a liberal arts focus, if you will. But I'd also suggest that the, that the beauty and the, and the tremendous advantage of a university like Northeastern, and Northeastern clearly at the forefront of this, is it's a bridge that Northeastern tries to build from the academic analysis of an issue to the practical implementation of solutions, which is why we speak in terms of experiential learning. We're trying to build that bridge and, and there's an opportunity at Northeastern to really do that. It's a university that, that is very proactive in identifying issues and developing solutions. And all of that is something that we've really been lucky enough to, to work with so many talented people over this last year to, to try to address. And so I think, you know, we've had some really, you know, holistic discussions in our council meetings. I know I attended a couple last year and I was really impressed by you know just the level of interest and you know the, the the deep focus on some of the areas around diversity and how the university can help some of the students that are on campus off campus the community so Uda could you talk a little bit about some of the things that we we talked about as you know kind of future state things that we'd like to see ourselves doing yeah, thank you, Allison. And I want to thank you and Ed and the Dean Strategy Council for both your wisdom and your philanthropy, um, because that combination is really what um, makes um, this group so powerful and so impactful um, for the college. And so, for example, um, the um, philanthropy helps support um, fellowships in the Humanities Center. The theme for the Humanities Center next year is going to be reckonings. I haven't actually had a chance to brief the two of you on that um, yet. Um, and um, so it allows um, graduate students to participate with faculty in intense discussion of uh, work that they are developing. And then there's always um, some public programming associated with it that draws the broader community um, into this as well, just to give you that as one of the examples. Um, supporting our um, colleagues in um, the work that we have run under the label of racial literacy, and that's been work that has been done between um, colleagues in Beauvais, arts, media, and design. Um, so again, I think some of you in the chat are alluding to the fact that there's, of course, multiple colleges at Northeastern. Rest assured that those colleges, while having their own identities, also really collaborate um, a lot. And again, this kind of work that's at the intersection of social challenges and health has been an important theme for the college um, for the while. And of course, um, COVID has made that even more urgent. Again, Elisa Lincoln gave you um, some examples there. Um, I, it's, it's really exciting, I have to say, to have um, 
to be able to ask these questions. And um, Alison, you taught me a no, new word, pandemic gifts. We have often talked about challenges and silver linings um, during the pandemic. And indeed, I think some of the examples that we are giving are indeed these silver linings. Um, the engagement with technology raises so many important questions about access, equity, um, justice, um, also bias in algorithms, for example. Again, with funding from the Dean Strategy Council, we've been able to support our ethics institute that is now very much involved in the university-wide cluster on these um, questions. We are bringing a new colleague, Rashida Richardson, in um, to the university who will be jointly appointed between the School of Law and our college, who's someone who interacts from her law perspective and from her activist perspective um, about um, questioning the ways in which algorithms are used, for example, in sentencing decisions, um, while working closely with computer scientists. And so she's someone who partially is attracted to Northeastern because she has a Northeastern law degree, but also because she sees this as a place where she can actually do this intertwining that I talked about of research, teaching, and engagement. And I already look forward to the kinds of co-ops that she will bring um, to um, the um, generation that follows Kyler. And again, you can see someone from political science like Kyler um, doing such important work where she got to the right briefs. And, um, and you know, Kyla and I had a chance to talk yesterday. She really impersonates what's so exciting about silver linings that we are finding because Kyla is now doing um, her uh, capstone project building on her co-op. And this kind of intertwining again has not of what we do in our classrooms and what we do when we engage with broader communities fortunately did not stall during the pandemic, but became even more clear because of the triple pandemics, just how important that is, as, as Alison um, and, um, and Ed have also powerfully said, right? That is really um, something that they are seeing Northeastern um, really having as a key value. And I just believe that that's key for the future of the liberal arts everywhere and see us at Northeastern with the support of parents, students, um, alums, um, really particularly well positioned there. You know, technology has really become the connector. And I wonder if there are things that you've done from a technology perspective, from a, an educational and teaching perspective that you think you might want to keep um, even after the pandemic is over and maybe everybody's back to normal. Any, any thoughts on that? I have lots of thoughts, Alison. I wonder whether we could just throw this question to Kyla and see whether she sees anything that she would like to keep or whether she recommends we don't keep much at all. And then I definitely give my perspective on that um, as well. And then we'll leave a few minutes for some questions from the chat. Great. Kyla? Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge fan of learning in person, I think, so I don't know if I'm the best person to be like oh let's keep everything but like definitely things I've that have happened in the classroom like as a result of COVID that didn't happen before um I think it's definitely become more like oh I don't want to say I want to say like open communication like there's a lot more channels I think that we've developed to, for students and professors to communicate like you know office hours have become easier for everyone um email, everyone's on their email a lot more than we used to be, you know, when you're running around in person, you don't often check your email, but now everyone's like on their computers all the time. So email's easier. Um, just like some of my professors have, one of my professors actually basically created a completely asynchronous version of the class where we, you know, we have a lot of different media type like lectures, movies, stuff we have to watch and listen to. And every, you know, two days we take or twice a week, we take a <laughs> little online quiz about it, you know? So it's like, we're constantly engaged in material in a way where we wouldn't really have time to if we didn't have most of that class online. Um, like, yeah, I'm trying to think what I would like to keep from COVID. I'm a very in-person type of person, <laughs> but yeah. Kyla, if I can interpret a little bit what you said, I so agree with you that in-person is so important. And yet what I hear you saying is that you too, for example, have engaged, maybe it was because of the topic, but maybe also because of the flexibility in, an, in what we call an asynchronous um, online class. And I actually describing how you are engaging 
in that and how you find office hours personal, even though, you know, certainly a few of our colleagues have been able to do them when the weather was good outside while socially distanced. And we are hoping that soon that will be more possible. Boston weather is looking up right now. But, you know, for a few months, that was just not realistic. And uh, what Kyla is saying, we have also just heard from so many students and colleagues. So, for example, my colleague, Serena Parekh, who's the director of the, our colleague of the um, politics, philosophy, the and economics program said in, in one moving moment that basically during the pandemic, and I think that's a gift that she gave to our students, um, she realized that the personal and the, um, and the professional were just intertwining more. She was raising her sons at home uh, while also teaching her students. And one of the things she decided at Halloween was that she would just make it a fun event. And so her sons actually marched behind her as Grim Reapers um, during her Zoom class. And, you know, I could so relate to what she was saying that this kind of deployment of one's kids for one's teaching mission would probably never have happened and yet I think it brought everybody closer made her sons feel better about you know their experiences but also brought her and humanized her obviously for her students um, in a way and again we know that not all of that can continue but I think these reminders that we actually found different ways of connecting as well I think are so powerful and honestly I will tell you from our advising team Kyla of course would never miss an advising uh, meeting but that we have had much, much fewer no-shows since we've been fully online because it's actually easier to Zoom in than have to take the walk across campus um, to go to advising. So there we will be thinking about what combination we will have post-pandemic and probably some appointments will remain on online and will also then allow, frankly, our advising teams to have a bit of flexibility. Maybe not everybody needs to do the one hour of commuting um, that many of them do in order to reach our campus um, each way um, every day. So I do think we will be learning some things that what's wonderful about parents and, um, and, um, and um, alums and the impact, um, the advice that you are giving us is that your engagement allows us also to allows us to tell you some of what we are doing, but allows us to learn from the organizations that you are so involved in as well. And that back and forth is also just really, really important um, for the college. So we definitely see, uh, continue to see some silver linings that are trying to think through what exactly um, to do. Our professional students, maybe I can say that especially, really um, um, have actually valued not having to commute to Boston so much when they are, for example, in New Hampshire. So I expect that in our master's program, we'll see more mixing of more modalities um, for a higher percentage of classes post pandemic than in our undergraduate classes, where we'll certainly have a bit of that partially because of the great mobility that our students are interested in, but where I expect, and many of you probably saw an announcement from our provost that just came out yesterday, we really are hoping that the pandemic will have taken so much of a turn that we won't have to distance it as much and that we can really have much more classes where on campus will be the prime on campus in person will be the primary mode of interaction in the fall. But just to give you one more um, example, and then Alison, I think we'll um, work with Matt to give us questions from the chat. For example, some of our economics colleagues have um, used, um, and many other colleagues have used polling functions that you can easily integrate into Zoom more during their classes. And they really like sort of the quick quiz and feedback that that has allowed. You know, previously we had some clicker functions for that as well, but they really like much better what's going on on Zoom there. Many colleagues also, Kyla, I don't know whether you have found that as well, have said that they find engagement from some students who find it hard um, to talk in large classes that they hear more from them in class um, discussions on Zoom or also in discussion boards where it's required. Uh, you have to respond and then you have to respond to one of your colleagues um, again. So again, some things that we are learning that we will, we actually have just formed a group that will do a much more organized report and um, we look forward to sharing that with the Dean Strategy Council when we have it later in April um, as well. Sounds good. Um, so Matt, uh, why don't we spend a few minutes uh, taking questions from our audience because we've had some very interesting conversation and I'd love to hear uh, some questions from our audience. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And so I think our first question, 
um, kind of leads into a second question, so I might ask them together. Um, one is the first one is just with many colleges kind of gutting liberal arts curricula, why has Northeastern uh, experience been different in this and making it a, a priority and having a, you know, a great program around it? And then along with that too, with a liberal arts program kind of moving into the future uh, and things becoming more and more digital and technology um, savvy, I guess, how do we continue keeping people that are a little bit more naive uh, and a little bit more novice to technology still engaged in the, in the public discourse about technology with liberal arts? Who wants to take that? Why, I, why don't I try to be brief and then um, the others can jump in as well. These are such good um, questions, um, of course. So one, um, the question one allows me to get on one of my hobby horses, uh, which is um, that the liberal arts, um, how the liberal arts matter, right? Which was also the theme or is the theme of our panel discussion, of course. I would just like all of you um, who have students who get these questions, why study the liberal arts um, today? And, you know, sometimes we have seen defensiveness and, on the part of our students around that question because they see, hear it so strongly from peers or sometimes from aunts and uncles. We just should keep in mind that students, um, including students at Northeastern and students at, um, at, at um, institutions that draw high talent students have very positive career paths. That was always true, it's true today. Um, that is true measured by the past as well as measured by um, life learnings life earnings as well. And that's just something where we've had a lot of misinformation. But why are they so, so successful? Alison early on said critical thinking, one of the key things that the liberal arts um, teaches, how to do, um, how to have an, um, an uh, argument how, and how to support that argument, how to think about context. And I do think actually, you know, here you're talking to a historian, this thinking about context and adapting to context has been so important to, during the pandemic. Um, having frameworks for understanding different viewpoints, having at the same time also frameworks for distinguishing, as Ed said, between truth and, and what is not truth. I do not believe in the notion of alternative facts, as you can um, see here. But again, having frameworks for that rather than having all the answers, that's what we can do together in the liberal arts. And what's so exciting about doing that kind of work at Northeastern is that we do that in such deep involvement with communities um, beyond the university. And that holds us accountable um, in important ways as well. That's always work in progress. We are by no means perfect, but it's a very exciting mission um, to be part of. And um, I let others answer, perhaps say a few more words about technology in that context as well. Yeah. Um, oh, was no, Lisa Kyler, you go first. <laughs> um, I was just going to add about like, you know, why, why do you study the liberal arts? Like that question that, you know, Uda was referring to. Um, I think Northeastern in particular does a really good job of prepare, not only preparing students for careers that they can use liberal arts degree, but showing students how they can use a liberal arts degree and showing students like different aspects of that. Like I've done almost all of my involvement is, in college has been through CSSH. I did two abroad trips with CSSH that really like, one of them we went to Serbia, Bosnia, Kosovo. And when we were there, we just met with people upon people, you know, who had liberal arts degrees working on all these conflict resolution and this, this real world problem solving. And because of co-op, you know, every student, when we're scrolling through like our co-op options, you see hundreds of jobs that are available to you as a student in CSSH and as a student who has those majors. And, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life when I came here. And I ended up in a co-op at the US attorney's office and I absolutely loved everything about it. And now I want to go to law school. So it's been, I think, the different types of learning experiences provided by experiential learning at Northeastern definitely like, you know, make us consider why why the liberal arts are important and how we can you know use them in our lives. Lisa? Um, just briefly, I would add that uh, on the research side in the past year with the COVID pandemic, we've seen such tremendous scientific advances in the development of vaccines and testing. And, um, and yet with all of that, I feel that at the university level, 
um, CSSH faculty, student, and staff teams have been drawn in upon time and time again this year to contribute knowledge and expertise to solving some of the most challenging COVID problems and racial justice challenges that actually are, are uh, in some ways, I think this year have proven far more complex than the development of some of our more basic science challenges. Um, and so Northeastern seems to be a place that appreciates uh, that diversity of approaches and thinking in tackling complex challenges. Well, Lisa, I, I would agree with you on that. And I think that Northeastern has a history of doing that. And I have to tell you that when I was at Northeastern, I, I had a few professors that I still see interviewed on television talking about some of these very interesting problems that we face across the country and in the world. And so I think that, that is, there, are, there is no truer statement. So Matt, do we have one final question? I think we've got about three minutes left. Do we have a, a good question that we can throw at this panel? Um, I, I think there's one, one question is just really more of kind of the demographics of uh, kind of C -H, uh, CSSH uh, and kind of, you know, with, with how things have changed, what is the true demographics of, of the, um, the body, the faculty and things like that between gender and, and race and other things of trying to have a diverse opinion uh, from many different backgrounds as well. Uta, would you like to take that question? Thank you, um, Allison and, um, and Ed, and you will also recall that these questions were questions that we have also really talked about with the um, Dean's Strategy Council and have really um, used um, your advice there as well, because like um, all institutions, um, reaching the kind of representation that, that the US Census um, calls for um, is work in progress for us at Northeastern. We have certainly made great strides there. If you looked um, to some of the um, two important state statements for, from our president over the last few, year, uh, few months, um, one in June, one in October, you would also see just how important that agenda is for the entire university. Um, CSSH um, faculty, partially because of our fields, partially because commitments to social um, um, justice are um, we are fortunate to have um, somewhat higher representation of historically underrepresented groups than many other colleges. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not work in progress for us as well. Um, in my time as Dean, we have increased substantially the number of women who are false professors. We still don't have parity there, but we are um, taking steps um, towards that. Um, so a lot of this is work in progress. I think one of the questions also rightly said that we see in college populations, women now overrepresented. We certainly have um, somewhat more women in the undergraduate student body than men um, as well. We obviously need to work as a society to make sure that men are well prepared um, from all backgrounds are well prepared um, to come to college. And that raises all kinds of pipeline issues. Those two, I think, are issues where we would we really want to do more in collaboration um, with advice from from all of you um, alums and parents as well, because so for example, we are doing a pipeline summer program um, this summer for all um, underrepresented admitted students in order to attract them to Northeastern, but also to put them on a good path through the university. We, our um, application numbers are way up in absolute numbers of uh, members of underrepresented groups. Again, we need to do a lot to make sure that we attract students, that we retain them. The retention is actually good for underrepresented students in the college. Um, again, so much work to do, so much advice that we can get from others. And, um, you know, I would just say um, um, parents and, um, and alums continue to tell your networks that this is an interesting place to look at and encourage students who are looking for colleges to take a close look at Northeastern from all backgrounds. Well, I think we're at time. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, Kyler, you in particular. I love, you know, I, I love to see graduates, you know, out there, you know, making decisions about their lives. Um, and I, I think it's important uh, for the, our community to realize that this, you are who we are creating. And, you know, I think it's, it's wonderful to see that, you know, you came to Northeastern with no idea about what you wanted to do and you left with 
a passion and with a direction. And so I think that that's really important. I'd like to thank uh, Dean Poiger, Ed, thank you very much. Um, all of the folks that have uh, you know, helped to put this together. Elisa, thank you so much for all the information on you know, the research that the university is doing. And I'd like to thank Matt for setting everything up, Jennifer. And I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and participation. And I wish you all a wonderful afternoon.